so many people don't plan ahead um and they kind of they wait until the, either the last minute or they just they're too late and they can't do anything um like i have i had a, a consultation yesterday and um the mom is she has dementia but she's so far gone that she can't do any plans so in order to actually execute and and go through the estate planning process you have to have capacity you have to know who you are you know who your kids are what assets you have all all of those questions um and if you don't have that it's too late and then you're stuck um you know with the court system so my biggest advice is don't wait until you feel it's the right time because if you wait until the right time, it's not going to be the right time. Nation, welcome to Empower Her Money podcast. I am your host, Angela Duncan, speaker, best selling author, serial entrepreneur. In this podcast, we talk about all things business and money. Today's episode is sponsored by Free Money Tips Book. Dot com free money tips book.com where you can download your free copy seven unshakable tips to start you on your financial journey today's episode i get to interview irema valdez with probate law miami and she's going to tell you why it is so important for you to plan ahead hello irema welcome to empower her money podcast how are you today I'm good. It's actually Irama. <laughs> ah, see, I'm the white girl trying to speak Spanish. That's what happens. <laughs> if you can't roll your R's, it's Irama. Irama. Okay, awesome. I will remember that next time. So um, thank you for coming on the podcast today. I would love for you to share with our audience a little bit about your background, where you came from, and kind of how you got to being an attorney today. Uh, well, I am almost, I'm almost 40. Um <laughs> I've been practicing for, um, this is my 14th year um, as an attorney, and I did not always want to be an attorney, um, but it just kind of, it happened, I guess, organically. Um, so when I first uh, went to college, I went for journalism because I love to write and print journalism, definitely not broadcast like the whole in front of the camera thing, not for me. <laughs> um, and while I was in, in school, I had a friend who worked for lawyers and she's like you should go to law school and I'm like oh no I don't think I'm that smart and she's like you should see the idiots I work with <laughs> and so I was like okay uh so I took the LSAT I got a good score I got into law school and I realized like you know I I like to argue um naturally so this is just a perfect fit and I'm I really like fighting for people um I would do it I did it before law school um for free so now I'm just you know doing it after law school for money um, and then with regard to the area of law that I practice, I practice probate, guardianship, estate planning. Um, and then we've recently added, and I say added because I've always done it. I just kind of, now I'm saying that I do it, um, family and um, real estate. Um, and I just, I got into this area, not because I like dealing with uh, dead people or, or, you know, people that are incapacitated, but um, I just... I didn't know that I loved helping people going through something so depressing and, and morbid and difficult. Um, and in my first year of law school, my mom um, nagged me to go sit with an attorney that does this, this exact same thing. And he also does tax, um, which I don't do. Um, and I was like, no, that's boring. It's like 10 people. Like, why, why would I do that? And I, of course, just to get her off my back, I sat with him for four hours. I was like, I'm not doing a whole day. And by the end of those four hours, I was in love with the area of law. And I was, I was, I'm lucky. And, and I also have her to thank um, for doing this the first year of law school, because then my, the rest of my law school um, classes were geared towards everything probate. I mean, and there were very few classes to take. It was mostly tax classes. So I actually know a lot of like estate mm -hmm. and corporate and gift taxes, but um, yeah, this was, that was just what got me started on, on my trust in estates, um, career. And I love it. Like it, it really is not as boring as other people think. Um, and it's different because every family is different. So yeah. 
Yeah. So I could see like the tagline. So I remember there was like a, a movie once that says like, I see dead people was a, a tagline in the movie. Yes. So it's not oh. like I help, I help dead people, you know? So yeah. it's like, well, I help dead people's families. families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Sure. So you have your own firm now. Were you always an independent or did you start off that way? Or how did you start your career? So I feel like my career started in law school. Um, my last semester I did, um, it's called an externship, but really it's like an internship somewhere. And I did it for the 11th Judicial Circuit, um, specifically for Judge Corvick, who was, I mean, she's not um, the judge there anymore. She retired, but she was like a powerhouse. The, that lady was goals. Um, she was awesome. But instead of sitting with her all the time, I kind of sat with the case manager supervisor who had been there for like 30 something years, at least brilliant. Um, and I learned everything probate and guardianship, like what the court needs, um, you know, what what to do, what not to do um, in both sitting with the case manager and sitting with the judge. I saw a lot of attorneys make mistakes and I learned a lot there. And um, so after I graduated law school, I took the bar and after that, um, I worked for the judge again, but this time as a paid position and as a case manager. Um, so I got to meet a ton of attorneys. I, I literally had like three, four job offers and I got to pick, you know, the person that I worked for before. And I was at that firm for about four and a half years. Um, and then I decided to go out on my own in January of 2016. That's amazing too. So you got to actually study outside of school, but you studied in that internship real life cases so not yeah. just a, a firm that you're working for but you got to see the good the bad what worked what the court system was actually looking for what helped the families in that situation and be a real student that was like involved in that so i think that's incredible and that gives you so much more of an expertise because you've seen so many different areas that people have done that now you're taking the best of all of those situations and applying it to your own practice and to your own business. So Not to you mention, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, I get to meet the judges and and in a different capacity than as an attorney before them. It was as their employee. And I got to really understand um, what they like about attorneys <laughs> and what they don't like. And so luckily what they like is something that's a natural fit for me, which is, you know, honesty, being prepared. Um, but it was nice because they got to, they got to know me too. And that has really helped me in my career um, because a lot of them are still there, but as, as they go retiring and new judges come in, they talk. And so I feel like I, you know, my, my reputation is something that they are, they are aware of and they know how I am and how, you know, by the book always. Um, so that, that really did help me as well. And as well as the staff. Yeah. And, and the judges is probably a very key point that people don't always think about, not just the attorney that you're hiring, but perhaps the judge that your case is going to be presented in front of. Mm -hmm. Um, I never studied law. I liked watching law and order. And I remember like the attorneys would talk about, oh, we're getting this judge or we're getting that judge. And it does make a difference, right? Because even though they follow the law, they also have their own personalities and kind of what they look for as well. Right. Yeah, I'm sure the the phrase is probably overused, but a good attorney knows the law and a great attorney knows the judge. <laughs> so. Oh, I like that. That's really good. Um, so then you decided to go off on your own. When did you make that decision and, and what kind of thought process did go, did go into it for you before you made that jump? So I made the decision um, over the holidays of 2015. My son was like five months old. Yeah, he was born in July. Um, so he was like five months old. And um, I realized, you know, I was commuting three hours on a daily basis mm. and was missing a lot of time with him. You know, I had to drop him off really early, pick him up super late. Um, my husband at the time, who I'm no longer married to, uh, <laughs> is uh, had a weird schedule. So a lot of it was, was on me. Um, but it was just, I was missing too much time as a mom. And that's something that's super important to me. Um, in addition to that, you know, I really didn't get the, the ability to choose my own cases and my own clients. Mm -hmm. And that became more important to me as I developed as an attorney. Um, I didn't want to represent people that weren't doing anything good and, or trying to take advantage of someone or lying. Like I just, I know that everyone, you know, the law says everyone deserves representation, but that was just that's never been me. So I like to, I like to be able to control that. And obviously I'm, I'm a control freak. Um, and you know, I also wanted the flexibility that owning your own firm, 
um, brings in terms of being, you know, a parent. So, you know, I'm room mom. I've, I've tried to be room mom every year. I missed once because I wasn't picked, not, not for anything. It's just, you know, it was, it's literally sometimes, um, what is it called? Like you pick a name out of a hat. Um, but I'm really involved with my kids' schools. And so for me, working for someone else and working for someone else so far, it was in downtown, um, was just not allowing me that flexibility. So those were really like the top reasons that I chose to, to go out on my own. Gotcha. Yeah. And I love that because then when people get to know you, they understand that you, you're a mom, you know, you have a heart and you have a family. So when someone's representing you that really, truly cares about themselves and about their own family, you know, for me, if that, if I was looking for an attorney, that would be something that's really important to me, not just understanding the law and the judges, but a good person too. So I could see that. Sympathizing with the situation, because sometimes when an attorney is, you know, doesn't have that personal connection to the case, it may make that representation a little bit more difficult and maybe the empathy and the understanding for what that person is going through. Mm-hmm. So un- fortunately and unfortunately, <laughs> the, the reason I practice the areas of the law that I do is because I've been in those situations in so many different facets. So yes, I completely agree with what you said. Yeah. So obviously you're, you're uh, representing people at a certain point in their life. What kind of advice could you give to them before they get to that point so that it makes you know, the family planning and your job easier if someone does pass away? Um, what can they do to make sure that they've got the right steps in place so that it makes that whole process easier for the family? So many people don't plan ahead um, and they kind of, they wait until the, either the last minute or they just, they're too late and they can't do anything. Um, like I have, I had a, a consultation yesterday and um, the mom is, she has dementia, but she's, so far gone that she can't do any plans so in order to actually execute and and go through the estate planning process you have to have capacity you have to know who you are you know who your kids are what assets you have all all of those questions um and if you don't have that it's too late and then you're stuck um you know with the court system so my biggest advice is don't wait until you feel it's the right time because if you wait until the right time, it's not going to be the right time. Um, so that's that's my biggest thing. And and some people also think um, I'll plan when I have money. And that is also incorrect. Planning is not just for the wealthy. And more importantly, if you don't have a lot of money and you have to be subject to, you know, a, a case like a probate case or a guardianship case where where is the money going to come from to pay the attorneys and to pay the court costs to get this done? So that's, and that's, that's my biggest thing is a lot of people are like, no, I don't have money for estate planning. I'm like, no, you need to do at least the basic stuff, which is really not as expensive as actually going through court. I tell my clients all the time and I'm, and I'm happy to say here, I don't, I don't even mind for a guardianship case, which is necessary when someone is incapacitated or you know, purportedly incapacitated, um, you have to go through two different cases. It's a mental health case to establish incapacity and then an actual guardianship case to appoint someone to make decisions for that incapacitated person. I charge $5,000 for that. And that's not a flat fee. Plus the about $1,000 in court costs between both cases and and all the other things that have to happen. And that's a family that's out $6,000. When I prepare advanced directives, it's like, I don't know, an eighth of that, maybe. And that's something that you don't have to renew. You don't have to pay again. It's a one time fee. As long as obviously you you still want to name the people that you named and you don't want to change it, but you know, it's, and anytime they want to make a decision, they don't have to go to the court. They don't have to go to an attorney. It's just, it's, it's one and done. And it prevents so many headaches. Um, You know, obviously the money part and not being subject to what a judge feels is the best decision for you. Um, you know, and your families can just decide for you, knowing full well what you would have decided, hopefully. Yeah. Can you share, obviously not naming names or very specific stuff, but any interesting cases that you have dealt with that were just kind of unique in situations? You know, it's funny because I I literally took out my notebook. Um, I'm like, I I know I have a ton of notebooks because I buy them when they're pretty, right? <laughs> like, so this one's my favorite color, as you can see with my background. And yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna start writing down all the cases because I have so many stories. And then I just I work through the problems and then forget it. Um, but okay, so unique. Um, 
Yeah, I have so many. Okay, all right. I'm gonna pick like one probate, one guardianship. Okay. Um, so one of my, oh my, God, my, I feel so bad for the for my client. I actually lost. I don't. I know this sounds like probably egotistical. So I try not to pick loser cases because I just don't want to make people pay money for something that I know that they're not going to win. But yeah. this one, I really thought I had. Um, so I had a gentleman come see me. This was this was prior to COVID. Um, and he actually met me in the courthouse when I was waiting to be seen for another hearing, but he, he like desperately wanted a consult. And I was like, just, just come meet me here. And he had lost his wife and he was devastated. Mm -hmm. And, um, they were together 26 years, married 13. Mm -hmm. And so I remember, I was like, yeah, no problem. You know, you have that. It was a very simple, it was like a house and a car. It wasn't even a bank account. It was just like those two things. I was like, okay, we, we should have no problem. Um, and the wife had two daughters from a previous relationship. And so, um, I filed the petition, you know, the spouse has priority as the personal representative. So it was an, a no brainer, just get him appointed. And, um, about, I don't know, maybe like two, three months into the case, they file, um, some sort of motion or petition. They had an attorney as well, the, the daughters, and they said, well, they weren't married. And I was like, what? what do you mean they weren't married? This is his wife. Like they, you know, the house and the house was in, in the wife's name alone. And so I did a search and sure enough, they applied for the marriage certificate and never returned it. And That's so, true. yeah, I had to hire, you know, a family law expert that was like, you know, just, she knew everything. And she's like, well, we can still fight it because they still applied for the certificate. And, and we had to go through like obscure case law and the judge unfortunately ruled against us. And they were like, there wasn't enough to, to say that they were married, um, you know, didn't meet the, the case requirements. So he ended up receiving nothing, getting kicked out of his house. Um, mm -hmm. His car obviously was, which was the wife's car, but they were using it together and he got nothing. Um, and I feel like if, obviously if she would have returned the marriage certificate, this would have been a no brainer, but if she would have gone one step above and created at least a will and left him as her primary beneficiary or left both of them, you know, like the daughters and the husband, like a combination, right. this could have been avoided and he would have not been out of house and home. And that's two very simple things, return the certificate and have an attorney draw up a document saying, these are my wishes. Yep. And so I felt so bad for him um, because it was just, there was nothing else I can do. Um, and then guardianship. Oh man, was, that's a lot of litigation there, but um, I think just a, a simple case, but really kind of impactful in terms of numbers is, um, I represent, well, I represented in the guardianship. I currently represent him in the probate because obviously no estate planning there. Um, it was, uh, two, two brothers and a sister and the dad was elderly and he had some sort of dementia. I think he was, you know, mentally so, so physically, definitely not Okay. And um, the the brothers were fighting over who should be his guardian. So all of the fight actually took place in the first case, which is the determination of incapacity. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're like, yeah, he's incapacitated. And then it, it shifted over into who should be the person making decisions for the dad. Mm -hmm. um, it was a four month case. I think it was from January to April when he passed away. Um, there was ever, never a guardian appointed. Um, one of the sons, not my client, um, stole or kidnapped the father from one rehab facility and put him in another rehab facility and then didn't let anyone else know where the dad was. Um, and of course the dad never executed a document that said, I want this person to be, you know, my, my power of attorney and this person to be my healthcare surrogate. Um, and so this whole fight took place. And I, and I say it's an important case in terms of numbers because what I charged in fees, which I, I, there was certain days that I was like, I'm not charging for this. I can't like, it's, it's too much already. And I, I feel so bad for this family, but my fees were close to 20 grand for four months of work, mm -hmm. um, which is still less than a lot of other attorneys charge, but it's still $20,000 that they had to pay me to fight to see who would be the guardian. And now we're in probate fighting again but you know we're 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 okay now we're we're almost done with this case which started by the way 2021 so we're in year almost getting to year three of this case um 
which could have been avoided with, you know, estate planning documents that would have cost a fraction of what, you know, the attorney's fees are, are charging. And it's my attorney's fees, the brother's attorney's fees. Luckily, the sister didn't get an attorney because then it would be attorney's fees there too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just so much money. And, and I'm grateful for it as a business owner, obviously, because it's, it pays the lights. But as a mom, daughter, human, it just, it just hurts me to see so many families going through this and not avoiding this by, by planning correctly. Oh, I'm getting a little emotional thinking about it. Cause like, as a parent, even though you, you think your kids might come together in that time of need, you're, you're might be creating more damage to their relationships because they're going to fight over that. So as a person, you want to do what's best for yourself and for your family and just execute a couple of simple documents. And you can always change your mind later. Like, right. As long as you're of like sound mind that can make decisions. Um, but it's not permanent, but at least it's, it's a step into helping your family not have to fight and deal with that later and know that these are your wishes that you want to be executed instead of the family trying to figure that out when they can't ask you anymore. Yep, pretty much. And I wish I could say that these kind of situations bring more families closer than apart, but yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, too many different perspectives and ways of thinking and not enough communication between families um, create that you know, hostile environment where there just exists more acrimony than harmony. Right. And they're emotional. So they're not making logical decisions most times because they just have this loss, you know, so that, 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 okay. So we're on a podcast and you had mentioned earlier that you are thinking about starting your own podcast. Tell me more about what that looks like and what it's going to be called when um, the listeners can expect to tune into it. Would love to hear more details. So I'm, I'm nervous and excited because I like I'm I like answering questions and I'm like, oh, my God, I, I love I want to be able to ask questions um, and really get, you know, different perspectives. It's, it's exactly what I was saying, like there's so many different perspectives out there and I think it's going to be like a fun project for me. Um, so the the name of the podcast is going to be Get Ahead Before You're Dead. Uh -huh. um, and I, I want to just interview so many different people with different perspectives, professional backgrounds, personal backgrounds, um, and really get to know, you know, um, just about different people, parents, people that are, you know, that shows the dink life, right? Uh, double income, no kids, um, you know, how they deal with life and how they deal with death. Um, and we're working on getting it together, hopefully by January of 2024. So yeah. And I think it'd be interesting too, if you can reach out and interview people from different ethnicities or different countries, because I'm sure their perspective on this entire process would be different than what we typically think about as normal here in the U.S. So I'd be interested mm -hmm. tuning into the podcast just to see some different perspectives from, you know, different backgrounds too. I think that'd be fun. I can do like one in Spanish and interview people from like South America. <laughs> yeah. That'd be even better, like just to see how they deal with it over there. Oh man, that'd be, yes. Thank you for the ideas. I'm, I'm going to write them down. Because I also, I believe probably the legal system is much different in not only South America, but Europe and Asia as well. I get a lot of clients from uh, Central America and South America. And um, there are some cases that we have cases here in Florida and also down there where, like I have one in Venezuela right now. And one of my first conversations was, you know, with the attorney that represents her down there. And he's like, the legal system here is nothing like the U.S. And I'm like, all right, tell me about it. He's like, judges can be bribed. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it just depends on who has like a better bribe as to what the ruling is going to be. I'm like, so you don't have like laws that you just follow and apply facts to. <laughs> and he's like, well, that's what I'm trying to do. But um, no, we have to like get the judge to be re recused. And I was like, oh my God, so what's going to happen? Um, so yeah, getting that perspective from other countries, even better. Yeah. And that loss of control too, for someone who has, likes to be in control. <laughs> you know, I honestly, that's one of my stressful cases because I don't know what's going to happen down there. And, and there's like no way to predict it. <laughs> so yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So I have a fun question for you. Okay. You could have a superpower what would it be and why? So, um, yes, I've had this discussion at length with my significant other because we love like Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. Um, so my favorite superpower, which kind of, I think would be like good and bad is being able to read people's minds. Mm -hmm. Um, I like, uh, Jean Grey from X-Men. That's, that would be, you know, other than turning into the Phoenix and then, you know, disappearing. <laughs> um, but 
good and bad, right? Like I want to know what people are thinking, but then I'm like, do I really want to know what people are thinking? So yeah, but still, I that's that that would be my choice. Mm-hmm. Like to know what people are thinking. Yeah, and then wow. you can know if they're being honest or not, and then they can decide whether or not you're going to represent them. <laughs> yes, that that's definitely a good side effect. I didn't think about that. Uh, great. So if our audience wants to get in touch with you, learn more about what you do, hire you, just follow you, get ready for the podcast, how do they reach you? So I think the place that we have the most amount of information on right now is Instagram. Um, and that's at probate Miami. Um, and I I'm everywhere. I'm on TikTok, Facebook. Sorry. If you hear like background noise, my dog is there sitting uh, chewing on a bone. <laughs> um, but uh, really just my website is probably um, my website and Instagram. So my website is probatelawmiami.com and my Instagram is um, probate Miami. And right. uh, I think that's what my Facebook is as well. Um, but my website has all of our contact information and our, our phone number is pretty, I actually picked it. I was super happy because I had another phone number and then um, I switched to like VoIP. And so I got to choose, I got a list. There was like a 12 page list, like single space, eight point font of phone numbers. So it's four, seven, seven, 11, 11. Oh, wow. Very right. nice. Very I'm, easy to remember. I'm a numbers person. So that was, you know, that was yeah. hard for me. And seven, sevens to me are good luck. So that's a good number. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time today. I thank you so much for having this podcast and I can't wait to have you on mine. Yay. All right. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much for tuning into Empower Her Money podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, share this podcast, and leave a review wherever you are tuning in.